welcome back to Community Theater at Docker. Glad you are joining us for our afternoon sessions today. I'm very excited to introduce to you three students from Berkeley uh, over in the East Bay here. They're going to be talking to you about how they built a food scanning app with Docker. And I'll let you guys introduce yourselves individually, but help me in welcoming them to the stage. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Risi. This is Lon. This is Vincent. We are all freshmen from UC Berkeley, and we are super, super excited to be here today and present you guys with the app we built, Food. <laughs> OK. So the idea of the app originated from a class I'm taking at Berkeley this semester. In the class, we've been, we've been discussed a phenomenon that nowadays, whether you guys are aware of it or not, we are all picky customers. I myself, for example, uh, has been rather picky. I've been working out recently and always trying to avoid high calories foods. So before I order, I usually like Google the food's cal calorie contents. And so menus like this would be a nightmare to me. Like, by just looking at those ingredients, like those tiny words, gonna take me a lot of times. So sometimes I will just get lazy. I want to make decision based on intuition. So if I see, OK, a turkey leg. It's turkey, so it must be healthy. Unexpectedly, it later turns out to contain 300 calories per serving. Well, another team member, Vincent, <laughs> is also kind of picky. He's allergic to milk. So menus like this. So menus like this would be a nightmare to him because it only contains the name of those dishes. So when Vince is trying to order, he needs to be super careful because some dishes may seem to be dairy free, but they are actually not. So um, we manually created this menu, but however, sadly, most restaurants nowadays have similar menus like that. And also, they won't explicitly say, OK, I'll mention milk or seafood, like fish, in the dish name. So sometimes people just need to make a wild guess themselves. And more, due to religious belief, health conditions like people with diabetes, and also just personal preference, people may want to avoid certain foods when they are ordering in restaurants or shopping at grocery stores. And we are trying to make their decision process easier by introducing the idea of camera is first. So camera is first is trying to like, it's basically describe a phenomenon that nowadays people will always f photo their food before they eat. And maybe send it, later send it to their friends or post it on social media. And our apps is kind of like doing the same things. We want you guys to be able to scan your food in dining hall or cafeteria. And then our app will help you to filter out the food you may want to avoid and give you back the rest in the list. And you can just make your final decision within that list. And just because we are trying to build an app to help people to avoid certain food, we also want to make sure uh, like their balance in nutrition intakes. So we create another features that um, so after you scan the foods and um, pick what you want to eat for today, and you can add those foods into a chart kind of things. And then the app will help you to calculate like calories contents, nutrition, and give you back some feedbacks like, OK, maybe you're eating too many vegetables today, and let's go and get some proteins. So above all, for users with our app, um, to what to eat and what not to eat is no longer a question. And for restaurants, maybe in the future, they don't need to like, spend money and to update their physical menus. But rather, they can just send those informations about their dishes to us so that we can accurate our scan on their menus. So when their customers are ordering, um, they can just use our app and figure out oh, what's in the dishes. Um, is it vegetarian? And so on. So with that being said, let's move to Long and Vincent to introduce how we implement the app. Uh, all right, thank you very much, Racy, for the lovely introduction. I'm pretty sure she has given a very clear um, introduction of the pain points our app is trying to solve. Now, 
please allow me and Lon to give you a more technological s a solution of the app. Um, so first of all, for the front end, um, to simplify the app development process, we decided to use Ionic, uh, very easy to use framework to develop our app. So um, now I'm pretty sure many of you guys are familiar with Ionic, but for the sake of clarity, please bear with me uh, for a very brief introduction of the framework. So Ionic is a complete open source software development kit uh, for hybrid mobile applications um, built on top of AngularJS and Apache Cord um, Cordova. Now Ionic is a very simple framework for app development and it allows you to choose your user interface framework um, based upon say Angular, React, or Vue.js. All right, that's pretty much it for the introduction. Uh, please, uh, le now let's move on to the API usages in our app. So as you can see here, we firstly decided to use Google Cloud Vision's um, platform API to, for food image recognition. Um, I mean, obviously, we wanted our app to be able to scan food and to recognize uh, its nutrients and its content. So we found Google Cloud uh, Vision's APIs to be quite handful, especially for this text. But of course, one future area of, of potential improvement would be building our own computer vision models. Um, but still, due to our current uh, limitations of our ability as college freshmen, uh, we're still uh, in the middle of deciding whether or not we should uh, improve on that. We also used um, an API from USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture's API. Uh, specifically, it's about food reports. Um, as you can see from this example here, it's a very reliable source for you to look up any, say, nutrient content in a certain type of food. Um, the example here uh, given is uh, when I looked up boiled eggs. And as you can see, it basically tells you everything about this type of food, uh, which will be later, uh, we, which we later use to calculate, say, the total amount of energies, calories uh, in, your, uh, your, in your total, say, daily food intake. Now, we also used an API from a startup called Adam M, uh, which is pretty powerful. It used basically natural language processing and also gives you a very comprehensive database of all the, say, potential allergens in this food. Now, the example given here is when I input, say, a piece of text that says a glass of milk. And then, very intuitively, it gives you the quantity um, in this text, uh, the, 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 the type of measurement and the food matched in this text. Uh, in this case, uh, it will be one cup of milk. Pretty intuitive. It also gives you the list of allergens present in this piece of text. And again, in this case, it's just milk. Now, allow me to show you a very simple demonstration of our app. So as you can see, the first image is after I scan all, all the food, say, in my uh, daily breakfast. And basically, it's just a glass of milk, two eggs, and a bag of peanuts. Um, and as you can see, these three foods are all very infamous for their allergens. Um, and then when you click on the analysis button, uh, you'll be redirected to the analysis page where we will basically give you a very brief summary, say, of the total calories in the food cart uh, and also helps you detect the potential allergens in the food in, in your cart. It also gives you a very brief uh, recommendation for today's food intake. Uh, for example, it's recommended that you have more uh, like 1,300 or so calories today um, that you have like five potential food health uh, warnings. Uh, and it's also recommended that you have some wheat or if you prefer some meat. Now, when you click on the allergens button, you'll be redirected to a page that specify all the allergens detected in your food card. Now, in this case, it will be milk, dairy products, or eggs, or peanuts. Uh, and each of which will have a more specific um, detail uh, description about this type of allergens and the countermeasures when you have some symptoms that demonstrate your allergies. Um, and that's pretty much it for my part. And now let's have Tony, or Long, to help us demonstrate how we actually use Docker in this app. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Long. You can also call me Tony. And this is DockerCon, by the way. So yeah, definitely, we've got to talk about Docker and all kinds of Docker technologies. So um, now I'm going to share with you um, the architecture of our solution, like how, how we use Docker and why we use Docker to solve our problems. So Docker is used both locally 
and on our production servers. So we choose Docker because it has a lot of advantages. Well, first, well, version consistency, like you, you never need to worry about the context or the environment that your program is running on. Yeah. Also, it's lightweight compared to like virtualization technologies like VMs. It's really lightweight, so we can like isolate the microservices, isolate the hosts and containers, so that when you when you want to scale our, our microservices, it's pretty much easy. And let's have a look. So, um, so for our dev team, uh, we use Docker Desktop. So we actually run Docker on, on our laptops and desktops. And for our um, production servers, we actually use Kubernetes because it's really easy to deploy and to scale. Also, as you can see, um, our Docker file is pretty simple with only a few lines of code. Well, um, our web-based front-end is built with Ionic, as Vincent had just said. It's static. It's an, uh, uh, an Angular-based framework. So it's pretty much easy to serve those files. It's just an Nginx. So this script, as you can see, it just basically just copies the config file for Nginx and will configure the container, like expose um, the port. Um, we use Azure DevOps and uh, all kinds of like continuous integration technologies, so that we don't have to manually like run um, run some Docker command or, you can, as you can see later, Kubernetes commands. We can we can just like have a release on our GitHub, and the webhook will just trigger the continuous integration. And in this case, um, our new image will automatically be built and be deployed. This is our Docker file for backend. It's also really simple. Well, our backend is, although it's simple, it's not like frontend because it's dynamic. It's it's not static. We can't just like serve those like um, JavaScript files um, to our frontend because those JavaScript files requires um, our server access. So in this case, we use Node.js. Um, we just pull the official Node.js uh, container. Uh, image from our Docker Hub, and in this case, we can just well do an npm install and npm start. As you can see, um, we put our npm install in our Docker file, and this will be cached. So, so um, when we deploy our image to our like Kubernetes server, the npm install has uh, uh, has already been executed, and we don't have to install all the stuff on our server again. Yeah, that's pretty much um, the advantage bring by Docker. And we use Kubernetes for our um, production server, although we just use Docker on our local machines. Um, the reason why we choose Kubernetes instead of using like single containers, like uh, like bare containers, like running Docker run on our production server, is that Kubernetes is really really easy to manage, to deploy, and to scale. Well. Um, so um, where does he, wait a sec, this is, okay. So um, this is our um, framework, like how a user request is handled through Kubernetes. As you can see, um, a user request comes in and hits our Kubernetes ingress server. And the ingress service can just forward um, the user request to do like two parts. Well, if the user request is for API, then we need to forward this to our backend because um, slash API means that it is actually accessing our like image API, image recognition API, or like food API, or anything, anything that requires our server access. If it's not like something like some static image, then it's not prepended, not prefixed by um, slash API. Then it's for for our front end. We can just forward this request. To our front-end container, um, as you can see before, like two or three pages ago, it's just an nginx. So after the after this request got hit by the container, well, it depends on container. If it's front-end, that's nginx. There's nothing more to talk about. But if that's backend, we can um, we use Express.js in our backend, and our Express.js has a router and can root those user requests to different functions, like 
the Nutrient API function, and you can send requests to those um, to those um, API providers and get back those information and send those information back to our users. If it's for our um, if the user is sending an image and we need to like rec recognize what is in this image, like what text if we're scanning menu, what food if we're uh, scanning food directly. So in this case, we are sending uh, requests to um, Google server, and Google server can um, recognize those images and return data from, from its database. And um, let's see how actually we configure the, the Kubernetes clusters. And um, this is the configuration YAML file for ingress and for no port. Um, the, the configuration file for Nopor is not exactly really important, but for ingress. I won't go, um, I won't go into uh, like much detail about it, but, but as you can see, they are really, really straightforward. That's part of the reason why I say, oh, Kubernetes is easy to deploy, because you can specify those arguments, and, Kuber and um, the moment you type like kubectl apply dash f something, Kubernetes will do those things for you. And um, in this configuration file, if the request is with a dash, um, slash API prefix, it's for backend. If not, that's for frontend. And since our backend and frontend share the same host, we don't have to consider the course issue anymore. So course stands for uh, cross, uh, um, so, um, wait, course, uh, course stands for cross origin uh, requests. So because they are, uh, those like um, requests, are requesting the same host, the same Kubernetes ingress. We don't have to deal with course anymore because it's the same host, same IP, same port. Yeah, that's the course policy. So this makes us easy to deal with um, those like deployment issue and the issue from the browser side. Um, this is a YAML for deployment. It's um, kind of like a Docker file, but this is for like how we use Docker. It specifies the same information like port or um, like a mount path, mount folders, but the difference is that it's, um, it's basically a way that like specifies how we get the Docker image, how we expose those ports, and how we, how we are able to uh, make use of this Docker image to, con uh, to connect this image, to connect, to connect this container to the uh, Kubernetes ingress through no port. And well, in the last, I would like to introduce our CI workflow. As, um, as I said, Kubernetes is easy to manage, but we still like to manage to make it a little bit more easier. Well, so from this CI workflow, um, our dev team create a like, release, and then there's a webhook. We use Azure's DevOps service. And as soon as the webhook is triggered, the Azure CI agent just build the Docker um, image and push it onto our um, Docker registry. And then it executes like kubectl apply. Not exactly kubectl apply like as from command, but um, Azure DevOps has its like, own um, YAML configuration for like, automatically doing this. And then as kubectl apply gets executed, kubectl gets the new deployment configuration and it automatically deploy the new version of our app, both front-end and back-end. So this really makes our life really easier because we don't have to like SSH onto our server and do kubectl anymore. And this also reduced the mistake. So this is pretty much what we three want to say about our app. And well, if you think we're like uh, introducing our app um, like good enough, Please, please, thumb up on our DockerCon app. And if you have uh, like any questions to ask us, feel free. We're here. Yeah, that's all. Thank you. <laughs>